All right, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm happy to, to be here, and it'll be great to interact with everybody this semester and year. Um, right, so what I'm going to talk about is joint with um, Yevgeny uh, and Antoine Song. So the question uh, that we're going to be addressing is, uh, can we, so we're going to be starting out with some three manifold with a metric. And the question is going to be, can we produce, produce minimal surfaces of prescribed topological type? So in the past few years, there's been a lot of developments. Every compact three manifold has infinitely many minimal surfaces and so forth. Maybe they're even equidistributed in the manifold. But in, the, in, in those examples, we don't really know precisely what the topological type is of the surfaces. Okay? And if we know something about the topological type, we can use it to study the three manifold that we started with. Okay? So let me mention the first result uh, in, this, uh, in this direction. So, so if I start with a surface in a three manifold, what I can do is let's look at the, so, so one thing you could do is you could look at all surfaces that are isotopic to the surface you're starting with, okay, and try to minimize area in, in the isotopy class of that surface. So, so if, if this number is bigger than zero, so in other words, you cannot just shrink your surface down to a point or something, a very small area. Then, so there's a theorem. This is due to Meek, Simon, and Yao in 1982, which says that you could minimize area and actually produce uh, a minimal surface. So you take a sequence in the isotopy class of your initial surface with area of this guy going down to the the infimum, and what and what Meek Simon Yao proved is that these guys converge to a to a let's do a different index to to something like this. It's a, so it's a sum where these n i or n j are positive integers, and the gamma j are embedded minimal surfaces. Embedded. Okay. And then the question is, how are the surfaces actually achieved from the surface that you started with? And it turns out that the, the way the surfaces are achieved from the, the guys in the, in the family is, is, is through neck pinches. So you take an annulus, and you could have things where the necks pinch like this, et cetera, bringing down the genus of the surface. So in the limit, if you get something disconnected, it means the isotopy class has changed of the surface that you started with. Okay. Um, a, pr a good example to keep in mind for, 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 for this kind of thing is just if I, if I take the torus like this, right, and I take a sort of a, a slice, so this is a, a T2 in T3. Imagine I had some wiggly torus. I could minimize area, and I produce a, a stable minimal torus. OK, so that's great. Um, the, 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 um, the, so so the, a consequence of this is that if, if sigma is incompressible, and that just means a pi 1 injective, then this process produces a surface isotopic to the one you started with. Then you produce uh, an isotopic minimal surface. Okay, so an example of an incompressible surface is the, is the two torus and the three torus. Okay, so any neck, so what pi one injective really means is that any, any neck you would pinch would only split off a sphere. Okay. So, so there's a natural uh, correspondence between incompressible surfaces and minimal surfaces coming from minimization. Of course, many manifolds don't have incompressible surfaces. So, so for that, we're going to uh, uh, I'm going to we're going to talk about 
trying not to produce minimizing minimal surfaces, but it, minimal surfaces that have index that have Morse index one. So let me erase this. Okay. Yes, question. Uh, yes. Check. Yes. Does that sort of argument work for any uh say multipolar over, over fundamental torus? Like, you know, rather than, than, than taking uh you know an horizontal one you take you know uh eight torus, is it still in does, does the, the mix on the young machinery still uh, it torus? yeah it will work. The question is is it incompressible and does it Yeah, yeah and do you, yeah. Mean, do you yeah, do you get an isotopic Minimize. That's the question. Yeah. Uh, have to. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I mean, I've never really understood this point. To be honest, I guess. Uh, yeah, I have to think a bit about the. So I guess it's you need two digit drops. Well, anyway, so, so let's let me move on for for now. But it's a, yeah, it's a good question. So, so what I'm going to be dealing with in the rest of this talk are um, Hagard splittings. And so all that means is I take my three manifold and I'm going to write it as a disjoint union of two handle bodies. Okay, so so this is what we call. So so let me just so I have two handle bodies like this. Sort of H1, H2. These are hand, so these are genus G handle bodies. Uh, genus G handle bodies. Okay, so this is a manifold with boundary. This is a manifold with boundary. And there's some kind of gluing map between the, b b between the boundaries. So there's some identification of the boundary of the first handle body to the boundary of the second handle body. Okay, so this is called, uh, uh, and, so if, and so this, so when we make that identification, the two boundaries of the handle bodies are identified. And, uh, and this guy here is called the Hagard surface. Any, any questions about the definition? So it's a fact. Uh, so it's a fact. It's not obvious, but every uh, three manifold has such a decomposition, has a Hagard, has a Hagard splitting. OK, so a quick proof of that is you just take a triangulation of your three manifold. So a bunch of, 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 of uh, simplices. And if you just thicken the, the, the one skeleton, the edges, then that becomes a, a handle body. Okay? And then the complement, if you scratch your head enough, you'll realize the complement is also a handle body. And they're glued together in some way. All right. So let me just l let me give some examples so, so of these kinds of decompositions. So the simplest example is just the three sphere. So the three sphere we could write as we just take two balls, right, and glue them together, sort of any way. Some, might, some, some, actually, all maps are okay. So then the next most complicated guys are the lens spaces, and and here, so here we have two handle bodies, where both of them are just tori like this. Okay. Um, so the other point I want to make about Hagar splittings right now is that if I have a genus G splitting, genus G splitting, uh, it's very easy to make a G plus 1 splitting. And this process of going from a, a genus G to genus G plus 1 is called stabilization. OK, so, so let me. So let me just draw what it means to go from a genus G to a G plus 1. So suppose that this is my splitting of genus G. What I could just do is glue in a little, take a little arc and, and, and glue in, so adding in a one handle. Okay. If I add in that one handle, then what, is it, what have I done here? Well, it means that I've actually cut out like a tunnel or something. And if you think, if you, t if you cut out a tunnel, you're, you're increasing the genus of the handle body. Okay, so you could always increase the genus, and we're not going to be interested in the splittings which come just from this trivial stabilization. So, 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 
So we're going to be interested in irreducible splittings. So the irreducible guys, which are, um, for our purposes, just not, they're not stabilizations. They're somehow irreducible. OK. Any questions? So right. Yes. Yes, it yes, it does not so it does not arise from a lower genus Hagard surface where you've just added in these trivial one handles. Yeah. Okay. So a basic question in topology uh, is, you know, I give you a three manifold, list all of the irreducible Hagard splittings. It's basically a question of how you could put a Morse function on a on a manifold of of sort of simplest in some ways. Okay. <clears throat> OK, so that's a little detour in topology. And now we're going to go back to geometry. So so by the way, just I forgot to mention the structure of the talk. In the first hour, I'm going to deal with three manifolds in general and some topology and state the theorem in full generality. And then in the second hour, I'm going to prove things only for the three-sphere. But it turns out that. What we do in the three sphere is also new, and it's almost it's just as hard. Okay, so if it, so just so. Uh, okay, so suppose I have a Hagard splitting. Um, the nice thing about this is that it gives us sweepouts of a manifold. Okay, and, and the sweepouts are pretty canonical. So, so I'm going to get a sweep out of the manifold, where, at time zero, it's just going to be. Just a one-dimensional graph in the first handle body. So this guy here is just the one-dimensional spine of the of the handle body. And then when t is larger, so sigma t is just isotopic, isotopic to the Hagard surface. You could think that when t is small, it's just the boundary. It's just the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of that spine. And then uh, as t increases, I foliate the whole manifold until I collapse onto the at t equals one. I collapse into here like that. Okay, so sigma t, sigma one is just going to be again another spine. Okay, so I have a, I have a sort of non uh, a Hagard surface gives me a non-trivial sweep out of the manifold, and now I can look at uh, sort of all sweep outs. Obtained this way. Okay, and then I could I could look at this min-max value, this number w, which is I take the infimum. So, so, so for every every sweep out in the family, I look at the largest area slice for each family i look at the, the, the sort of maximal area slice i take inf and this number is positive and uh, so this minmax theorem proved by simon and smith in i think sometime in the sometime in the mid 80s i never remember when uh, he proved they proved that there exists Gamma one through gamma k, which are embedded uh, minimal surfaces, and we also have integers n one through n k, uh, such that the width is equal to the the sum of the areas of these minimal surfaces. Okay, so, so this number w is a critical value of the area functional, and there's some minimal surface which maybe has that's weighted by with integers, uh, which produces a minimal surface like this. Okay, and also the genus can be controlled, so you can control the genus uh, from above uh, if g is the genus of the initial splitting. So this is something I, I proved in my thesis, and I'll, I'll talk about it later. Yeah. Any any questions? Okay. <coughs> so if you've never seen something 
multiplicity, I mean, you could imagine that you know, you're sweeping out your manifold with two spheres. And somehow something weird happens where the surface sort of starts to fold into itself. Right? And the limit, you just, you just get a sphere with multiplicity, too. Okay, and, and so that's what these integers are, the multiplicity that the guy appears with. Right. So you, so you might ask, uh, um, when does this not happen, right? When can I run this min-max procedure and not decompose into smaller pieces? It's, it's sort of a natural question. And there had been a conjecture. Sorry, again, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so what, what, what the, the, f the fact that the limit can contain multiple components with multiplicities means that you're not isotopic t to what you started with. So the question is, is there some condition on the manifold which will mean that when you do this procedure, you don't degenerate into things of, s of smaller genus, into multiple components with multiplicities, all the bad things that can happen. And it's basically saying, is there a case where the bad things of min-max don't happen? Including the multiplicity problem. Including multiplicity, everything, yeah. So right, so I'll, I'll 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 write what their conjecture was. So, so they conjectured that if, if so, this is my initial Hagard surface. So, uh, so if the surface is what, what's called strongly um, irreducible, I'll, I'll explain this condition after. If, if this if the splitting is strongly irreducible, then then sigma is isotopic to an index one minimal surface. Modulo, one thing that can go wrong, which will be a case in the theorem that I, I present. Okay, So I haven't, I, I told you what an irreducible splitting is. Th they conjectured it for things that were not quite irreducible, but, but, but actually strongly irreducible. So I need to introduce that term. Right. So let me do that. <clears throat> okay. So, so a Hagard surface, so I'll just write. Hagard surface is strongly reducible uh, if every essential disk uh, in, to, one, to one side, to one handle body. So I'll draw a picture after intersects every such disk to the other. Every such. So, so the picture is, so what's an essential disk? It's just a, a disk that, that's inside one of the handle bodies bounded by a curve like that on the boundary. So, that's an essential disk to one of the handle body. It's saying that if I have a curve which bounds a, a, a disk on this side, then it intersects every such curve which bounds a disk in the other side. So a, a curve bounding a disk in the other guy could be in, on the surface, you know, some complicated, you know, some complicated curve. But, but, but it has to intersect this disk if it bounds a disk in the other handle body. Can you repeat that again? Yeah. So, sorry, my handwriting is a... So every essential disk Bounding every essential disk bounding a disk in one handle body intersects every such essential disk. Every, every, sorry, every curve bounding a disk in one handle body intersects every such curve bounding a disk in the second handle body. Okay. But did you define essential disk for it? Yeah. So so think of it as just so it's just a um, if I were to compress along this disk, the genus will go down. You can think of it like that. Excuse me, but uh, the other essential. Same? Yeah, this one here? Yeah. yeah, so this is not an essential, it does not bound a nice disk in this handle body, but it could in the other handle body. So you mean the two curves? Yeah, the two curves intersect. 
Well, the boundary of the disk. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you think it's like a maximally twisted kind of kind of uh, Hagar splitting. Okay. So. <clears throat> Right. OK, so, so, so let's just uh, let me just explain the basic things about strong irreducibility and give you some examples. And then I'll state, I'll state our, our, our theorem about their conjecture. Well, this calls for a sphere. Sorry? This calls for a sphere. Well, sphere, uh, yeah, yeah, sphere, don't think of a sphere. Yeah, sphere is too, no, yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's true for lens space. It's true for lens space, that's it right. It's true for lens space exactly exactly yeah exactly that's right so the, so the, the first fact we need which we'll, we'll I'll actually use is that you know the language is not is not wrong strong irreducibility those are irreducible splittings okay except for one one except for one thing which is the genus one splitting uh, splitting of um, s3 so the, you always have this proviso Right, because the genus one splitting of S3 is a, it's a, it comes from the genus zero splitting by adding a trivial handle, but it, it, it technically is strongly irreducible, strongly irreducible because, right, you have, you know, this guy bounds an essential disk here, and then you have this guy here, which bounds a disk in the other handle body. So it, so all, all these, so it's, it's strongly irreducible, but it's not actually irreducible because. But there's only one such thing which is not like that. OK, and the, and the other thing which we need is a theorem, which is what about the converse? Are all, are all irreducible splittings strongly irreducible? And this is a theorem of Cass and Gordon. Uh, so they prove that um, if M contains uh, no incompressible surfaces, Okay, then, then the two are equivalent. Then irreducible, irreducible splitting implies strongly irreducible. Okay. Maybe I should just give some examples. Uh, it will help things a little bit. So, so for instance, if I take S3, if I take a quotient of a three sphere by some finite group, that is, it has a manifold with positive curvature, right? So there's no even stable minimal surfaces that are orientable. So, so, so this automatically satisfies this condition that there are no incompressible surfaces. And so, uh, all, um, so all, all irreducible splittings in space forms are this strongly irreducible. So, yes, you, yes. Do you have any other irreducible splittings besides one? Oh, OK, so it doesn't have to be on yeah, it could be another. Yeah, I, I don't know. In the genus two examples, I think there are very few irreducible guides, but I, I don't know the exact classification. Okay, so this is an example where they're all the same. But here's an example to keep in mind where they are, where they are different. So, so I'm going to take just the three torus T3. So what is the Hagar genus? So so the the way to to take a three torus and and uh, find an irreducible splitting is like this. OK, so now you're going to regret that I didn't use um, a picture. OK, so I'm trying to draw a genus 3 surface. So I'm failing because I can't really draw. So I did, this is genus, so the, these sides are identified, right? So it's genus 2. But now I want to draw, and this is where my artistic failure, so I want to draw this guy going out and also going into the back. Does that look, right? So because this is identified with this, it, it's actually a genus 3 surface. You can stop me if, if what I'm, you know, it's okay. Okay. So, so this is a, so this is an irreducible splitting. Okay. It, it, it's lowest genus, so it realizes the Hagar genus, realizes the Hagar genus is the lowest possible way of dividing it. Uh, genus three. Okay, but it's not strongly reducible. So, so just the point is this is not strongly. Um, irreducible, and let me let me uh, to prove that I have to find two curves which each bound in the opposite handle bodies which uh, are disjoint. 
So, OK, so one of them will just be this guy here. right? So that just compresses a nice little disk in, into the, that piece of the torus. And then the other guy, so to do it, I'm going to imagine looking at the thing from above. Can people see this picture? OK. So imagine, so here's, so this is the view just looking at the thing from above. I need to find a curve bounding in the opposite one. So I'm just going to take you know, this curve like this, and like this, and like this, <laughs> and like that. So, if you, so it's the curve that goes like here, out here, out there, and out there. It's a picture. If you cut along that curve, if you cut along that curve, this, this cross just becomes two parallel planes with a, with a neck going up and then a neck going down. Okay, so there are two curves which bound in the opposite handle bodies. And so it's not strongly irreducible. And, and there's a theorem. Just erase this. So, so, so this is just to give you some texture about this conjecture. So there's a theorem of Ross, of Vittore and Ross. Which say in some in some flat three tori, uh, there does not exist an index one uh, minimal uh, genus three surface surface. Okay, so it's not true that every three manifold is going to have an index one minimal surface in its isotopy class, Re realizing it's uh, any any irreducible splitting. Okay, but, but this is a theorem, yeah, sorry. So this is sort of showing that the conjecture of Pitts and Rubenstein is in a way sharp, that you need the strong irreducibility. Irreducible is not enough. Uh, just one point is I don't know if anybody has figured out what the width of all these tori are. I mean, it's an interesting question. What is the width um, in the sense when you do genus three splittings that you actually get? Okay. Right. Okay. All right, maybe I'll erase this. So I'm, I'm first going to just to. So I've never really thought about it. I think Andre thought about it one time. It, what the width of the flat tori is. Mm. I think that the possibility is with two flat points. Mm -hmm. uh, those that have less area than the mm -hmm. three guys. <coughs> but it's, yeah. And it's a model with the zero value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah. Then, and, uh, so every manifold has a strongly irreducible head of prism? So only the ones which are not, uh, which are non-hot, <coughs> so which have no incompressible surfaces. Then all the irreducible ones are strongly irreducible. But the three torus, I, I don't think it has a strongly irreducible guy. So what I'm going to do is first explain why they can like what the purpose, what, why this was interesting to them, and then I'll state our theorem. Um, okay. So the reason they were interested in that kind of result is because of a, um, a conjecture of Waldhausen. Uh, from the from the seventies, which was the following thing. So, so it was the conjecture is that so, so non hocken three manifolds contain finitely many um, irreducible splittings. Of a given genus. So this conjecture has been proved in the sometime in the in the two thousands by Tao Li, and his proof uses what are called almost normal surfaces. Okay, and these these are like combinatorial analogs of minimal surfaces. So it's sort of it's begging for an analytic proof. Um, and, and with that theorem, you can, you can give one. So, so, so I, I want to just restrict to the case where the three manifold is a hyperbolic manifold. Okay, so there are a lot of hyperbolic manifolds which contain no incompressible surfaces. So I, I didn't say so. So having no incompressible surfaces, this is what is called a non hawken Check out the 
Sorry? Sorry? It, it contains an incompressible surface. <laughs> yeah. Right. <coughs> so, so if we had this conjecture, how would we, how would we prove uh, Waldhausen's conjecture? Well, Yes, yes, yes. Irre yeah, by irreducible splittings, I mean finitely many up to isotopy. Okay, so, so, so how would we do it? So suppose not. Right, so then I have infinitely many, so I have infinitely many splittings. If this, so because the manifold's non Hawken, uh, all of its irreducible splittings are strongly irreducible. So using the Pitts-Rubinstein, we can isotope this guy to be a index uh, to, to be an index one, one minimal surface. Okay, so so I have, I'm assuming I have infinitely many. I isotope them to become minimal surfaces. So we're, the genus is fixed. So that, so they all have the same genus, and in a hyperbolic manifold. So the area of these minimal surfaces, the area of a genus G minimal surface is bounded by 4 pi G minus 1. It just come, follows from Gauss equation. Very, it's very elementary. And of course, the genus of all of these guys is fixed. So, so if I could pass two minimal surfaces, I would have an infinite sequence of minimal surfaces, index 1, with bounded area and genus. So this space is not compact, but it has a nice compactness. So, so, so what you get is that the sigma i converge to some surface uh, with multiplicity, maybe. So, so sigma infinity is, a, is smooth minimal. But maybe it also has multiplicity. But I'll explain a little bit later. You actually get that the multiplicity is 1. So you converge smoothly to a minimal surface. But then they all had to have been isotopic to each other, because they're converging smoothly. Eventually. Eventually, yeah. Right? So this gives a contradiction. So it's really the power of the compactness theorem coming from minimal surfaces, bounded area, and bounded genus. How do you get the n equals 1 there? Say? So yeah, so that takes some doing. But that follows from strong reducibility, that you cannot have multi I mean, get multiple covers. There's only one, one net there. Like, so it's, it's a very sort of one net scenario to run. Like, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's right. Say? Where is the contradiction? So you have infinite. So I'm. So you have infinitely many, yeah. converging. I'm claiming. I haven't proved this yet. To multiplicity one to a smooth minimal surface. Yeah. If they're converging smoothly, eventually they're all isotopic to each other. Yeah. And we're assuming that you had infinitely many, which were distinct minimal surfaces. Yeah, but as you say, because the index is one, there really can just be one neck forming. Uh, yeah. So actually, there's an interesting. There's an example where you you do get that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Okay, so let me state. Okay, I've made a mess of this board, actually. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me state our theorem. <clears throat> so I'm going to state a real theorem, you know, with no simplification. It's going to be the thing that is true. <laughs> It's slightly less clean than their conjecture. Let's we'll see. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so this is with uh, Yevgeny and Antoine. Okay. So maybe I'll use the whole board. So, so let H be a strongly uh, irreducible splitting. Okay. Then we have uh, one of the following holes. So the first possibility is what we like, which is that H uh, is isotopic to an index 1 
one or zero minimal surface. Okay, so that's the nice case. Case number two is a little bit worse, which is that H is isotopic to the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of a non-orientable minimal surface. Uh, with a vertical handle attached. So I'm going to explain exactly what this means soon. With a vertical handle attached. OK, and, and, and um, let's see. Let me give this surface a name, sigma 2. So h is isotopic to an index 1 or minus 1. Or we get that. It's isotopic to the tubular neighborhood of an unorientable minimal surface with the vertical handle attached uh, and the double cover. Is stable. OK. Any, any questions about the statement? So this is, this is just for, for, so I'm going to describe two in more detail. Um, and then finally, if the metric is bumpy, so if G, if, if the metric is bumpy, then we get the improvements that um, the index uh, in case 1, in case 1, is, is equal to 1. Uh, and and uh, if it's bumpy in case 2, we get, so we get something more. We get an orientable minimal surface. of genus. So one less than the genus that we started with. So even in case two, generically, we produce an orientable minimal surface with genus one less than you start with. So it's a, any questions about the statement aside from what two means, which I'll, I'll draw next? Uh, if you take rather than bumpy, mm -hmm. the topological assumption that your background manifold is uh, Three yeah. So Can you say something more? In the three sphere, all we do is we produce with a bumpy metric an index one minimal two sphere. No, 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 but without yeah. bumpy. Just three sphere, yeah. so simply connected. Yeah. Can you say something more than the general assertion? In the three sphere? Well, in the three sphere, the only strongly reducible, there's none except for the, the splitting by, by the two spheres. So ah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So is this the original conjecture allowed for case two? Yeah, so the original, I didn't write it because I would have to write it twice. But the original conjecture allowed for case two. But I'm going to give an example and show that actually it can be the case that one is true, that one fails and you only have two. So it could be that, that, the, that this, so that this really happens. Okay? Yes? Is there any, in case two, on when the metric is bumpy, do you have any restriction on the index of the orientable one? Oh, yeah, that's in, well, here the orientable index is equal to one, is what I'm no, saying. Oh, in the second case, the yes, no, you're right. That's perfect. Yes, yes, yes. I just was being lazy, right? So, so the index is equal to one. Yeah, orientable minimal surface of genus and index, and index equal to one. Thank you. Thanks. So this 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 we realize later, and actually, so this is that you still get something orientable, just maybe one less genus, and I. Uh, Okay, so, so let me stop y yammering and explain explain a bit about case two. What 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 can happen? So 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 suppose I take a surface which is non-orientable. <coughs> so suppose I look at the the boundary of the tubular neighborhood of that surface for some small epsilon. So in other words, I'm looking at at, at, at some a set like this. This is the blue set. OK, so, so this guy, because this is not orientable, is going to be an orientable surface. <coughs> and it's going to be connected, right? If the middle guy was orientable, then the tubular neighborhood, its boundary is disconnected. But because it's not orientable, it's connected. 
And so what does it mean to add a vertical one handle? It just means that we, we do this. We just, we just add a one handle like this and remove these two disks. So that's the operation. So, so what this is claiming is that you take your Hagard splitting, you do a single uh, neck pinch, and now you're isotopic to the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of a non-orientable surface. Let me give an, an example which, of where this happens. So let's just take RP3. And the way I want to think about RP3 is just, just in, our, in I just take the three ball, and I, ta I, I take the quotient by an equivalence relation where x is related to, b to y if uh, x and y are both in the boundary of the ball, and uh, x is equal to minus y. Right, so we're just identifying the antipodal points. And that gives you R3, uh, RP3. So, th so this manifold is diffeomorphic to RP3. OK, so, so what is the strongly reducible splitting we, we start with? So let's start with just a, uh, so I claim that that's a, a Hagar torus. So this here is a genus 1 uh, Hagar torus. Right, so on one side it just bounds a torus. And on the other side, again, you have to scratch your head and, and realize that the complement is also a, a genus 1 surface. OK, so <clears throat> so but what could happen in this min-max process is you could imagine that your sort of min-max sequence starts to look something like this. Okay, and then in the limit, what you're getting, right, if you were to pinch this neck, you would just be getting this guy here. With, so you would just be getting, uh, so, so after doing, so, so this is, right, so this is, so the boundary is an RP2. This is the tubular neighborhood of the boundary. And here's a one neck being, a vertical handle being added to get back the surface. Okay, so that's, that's how this happens, how it at least could happen. Okay. Maybe I'll. So I want to give an example of three manifolds where of three manifolds, which are RP3, where you, you, you just do, there's no index 1 minimal torus. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define a family of metrics. So this, so this is showing the uh, case 1, case 1 fails, case 2 holds. So I'm going to consider a family of metrics on RP3, which look like the following. So they're just gonna they're just gonna go like this, and then they're gonna be rounded off like that. So 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 think of this as a three ball, and this is the boundary which is being identified via the antipodal map. Okay. So so, so let's just call this length uh, L, and this surface here sigma L. So it's an RP three. I can run this min-max procedure. So there's some observations. So the claim is, uh, for f if L is large enough, uh, G of L has no index 1 uh, Hagar torus. Okay. So the first observation is that, so suppose, so we're going to do it by contradiction. Suppose there's an index one guy in that manifold. 
it's got to intersect this boundary. If it didn't intersect this boundary, it would be contained in here. And it would be contained in a three ball, right? Which means that it's not really a Hagar surface. So it's got to intersect this boundary. It cannot, it cannot just go like this, OK? Because it would violate the maximum principle. I have a foliation like this. That means that what it does is something very weird, right? It, 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 goes over, it, has to, it has to cross through there like that. Right? So, it, so it's got to do this. So this is what the purported minimal surface is, gamma L. Um, but, but, but you could see by the monotonicity formula. Right, that, the, that this means that the area of gamma L would have to go to infinity uh, as L goes to infinity. Yeah, it's got to go to all the way to the side. Because if it were just not to, then you see the you'd have a it would touch it would violate the maximum principle because it would touch this foliation on one side. Okay, but but then but there's a theorem then by um, using the Hurst trick, which says that if you have metrics with uniformly f bounded uh, from below scalar curvature, and you and you you have an index one minimal surface then the area is a priori bounded. Okay, This comes from the Hirsch trick. Th this manifold does have positive scalar curvature because there is one direction where it's curved. The other direction is just the flatter direction. OK. OK. So, so even with positive scalar curvature, you don't always have a minimal surface in the isos iso isotopy class of a strongly reducible splitting. Question? That's a very good. Um, it may be that you can make an optimal foliation once. You, so the way we do it, we don't know that it's the area of the width, but but once you have it, you can make an optimal foliation probably, and then and then argue that it is the width. So with respect to one, to be the area of the width, and two, the area is half the width. Two, the area is half the width. The area of the the area of the non orientable minimal surface. Uh, no, so if you do min max in this manifold, the width is going to be this guy. It's not, it's, not this, it's not this guy with multiplicity 2. So, so I'm not going to say more about it, but this is where the, the second part, where we get an index 1, we get something of genus 1 less than we started with. That's where it comes from, that, that you, you get a surface like that. Any other questions? Where Sorry? Where is this? Um, Which sir? It's this two sphere. It's this unstable two sphere. If you choose me to work the uh, degenerating handle, if you get it to disappear. Say it again, sir. You must have a handle uh, yeah. degenerate into a curve. So where, where is the handle? The handle is just a very long handle. It's a very tiny handle like that, which degenerates. This is the width of that three manifold. So you could rule out getting an unstable something, this guy which has an unstable cover by using the catenoid estimate. Basically, you're making a sweep out with less area, but you can't rule out that the lift is is actually stable when you do it. Any any other questions? So in the last in the last few minutes. I just want to, are there any other questions? <laughs> OK. Um, so, so, <laughs> so I'm going to, so I'm, uh, in the last few minutes, I'm going to explain why strong irreducibility is so important. Um, so, so suppose. So this is a little proposition. Suppose I have a H is a strongly reducible splitting, strongly irreducible splitting, and I do min-max. Okay, so let's I do the min-max procedure. Okay, and I get some some crazy guy, which is some integer-weighted 
yada, 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 where these are all minimal surfaces. Uh, the proposition says that if the genus of, of one of these guys is bigger or equal to 1, then uh, n, the, the corresponding ni is equal to 1. So this is very important, because it's saying, suppose you get something orientable, then anything with genus has multiplicity 1. So it means that what you're getting is something like, you know, you're getting a bunch of pieces with genus 1, but maybe you're getting some, some spheres with some multiplicity, et cetera. And it, it follows from this strong irreducibility assumption. So in the last five minutes, I'll, I'll explain that. Or, uh, OK. Ah, I wasn't going to do that. That's OK. So the key point is so the key point is that the min max limit, just like Meek Simon Yao, uh, is achieved after surgeries. So it means I have my min max sequence going very close to, to the limit. I do some surgeries, and then if I have multiplicity n, it means that there's n copies of the of the of the guy around it. So that's the first fact. And the second fact is that by strong irreducibility. Uh, irreducibility, all surgeries uh, must be on the same side into the same handle body. So, so let's say the manifold is H1 union H2, and all the surgeries have to happen into one side. Okay, so, so if I have a handle body and I do surgeries, what do I get? I get handle bodies of smaller genus. Okay, so so I produce handle bodies. Let's just call them uh, H1 through HK, sort of with a tilde. So this is starting with this handle body, doing surgeries to get smaller handle bodies. Produce handle bodies like this. Um, right. So 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 let's pr try to prove this. So the proof of the proposition. Suppose some guy, some, some surface gamma i has a genus uh, bigger or equal to 1. And it has multiplicity at least, uh, suppose it has multiplicity at least uh, 3. So let's assume that the multiplicity is bigger or equal to 3. So let me draw the handle bodies. So, so, so this arose from the strongly reducible guy via surgeries. And all the surgeries are on the same side. And so I want to draw in these handle bodies. You see, this guy is not a handle body. It's just a surface cross an interval. And this guy is not a handle body. Uh, but, but, what, but they have to alternate, right? So, so if, I color, if I color this in blue, right, I have to, there has to be blue here or blue there. Right? They would alternate. And so, but, but that's not a handle body. That's a surface cross an interval. OK, so let's just assume what I said made sense. Uh, so that rules out the case where n is equal to 3. You just have the case of n is equal to 2. How do I know I don't have two sheets? Well, then, so which side are the handle body sides that I've produced? It's got to be this here and then everything else out there. Right, so this is h1, uh, and this guy here is h2. OK, so that so means that manifold is really simple. It's a handle body with a handle body here, and now I have a surface cross an interval. And the question is, how do I get, how do I get back my original Hagard surface it, doing inverting of surgeries? Well, there's a theorem that says the only way to go back is by adding a single handle like that. OK? So that means my manifold just looks like this. And, and I'll just draw a picture to show you that if that's the case, you can find. Uh, you could easily find two disks, uh, which, which are essential to, to the opposite sides, but don't. Right, so on, on the blue side, it looks like this. On the other side, it looks, it looks like a surface 
minus a disk, or sorry, this is gamma i, minus a disk uh, across an interval. And it's easy to find two circles. One just, you take that curve, and the other one, in, in the other handle body, you have a curve like that and then like that. Okay, so, so it, it violates strong irreducibility, which means the multiplicity is one. That was rushed, but we're not gonna, we're just gonna, we're gonna use that fact uh, in the second part of the talk. Okay, and thanks for your attention. Sorry. Uh, I, I'm not apologizing, sorry. No. <laughs> I have nothing to apologize for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So now uh, we get to go into actual details. <laughs> the, um, okay. So what I'm going to do is, so when I say Pitts Rubinstein conjectured this, they didn't actually conjecture. They, they had a sketch of an argument. So I'm going to present their sketch, which will take a few minutes. And then I'll explain what the missing ingredient was. And then, uh, and then I'll, I'll talk about our proof of that, of that statement. So let me start with, sorry. Right, so, so let me talk about what their sketch was. Okay, so we have a manifold, and we have we have some we have some Hagar decomposition, and it's strongly irreducible. So, so what they do is so let, let's say H is the H is strongly irreducible. So they, they, so they say we do our we do the minmax procedure. Okay, so step one is just do minmax. Okay, maybe we get something isotopic to what we started with. In that case, we're done. Okay, if that doesn't happen, what could happen, right, is that it could it could the limit could degenerate, and as I've tried to explain, the genus of any orientable guy just has multiplicity one. So what could happen is it could uh, an essential handle could pinch on one side in the limit, and you might get so, right? So you so you get a bunch of surfaces. Um, let's call gamma one through gamma k, which have genus uh, big or equal to one, and the, and the other guys that you get are just spheres, right? So then I get gamma k plus one. Maybe it has multiplicity, etc., all the way up to m l gamma l, and these are just spheres. So maybe, so maybe what happens is, uh, is some two sphere pinches off, maybe with some multiplicity. Okay, so that's step one. So we, so we do min max. Um, step two is we remove uh, the interiors of the minimal surfaces we obtained uh, to get to get uh, a manifold with, with minimal boundary, with minimal boundary, uh, let's call it m prime. So what that means is what I'm doing is just throwing away, suppose I get a sphere here, right? I'm just throwing away the inside there. I'm throwing away the inside of this torus and the inside of that torus. Okay, so now I have a, a three manifold with minimal boundary. Maybe there's, so, 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 so uh, for, yeah. Yeah. So on one side it bounds just a handle body, uh, and on the other side it bounds something very complicated. We just pick the side that's a handle body. Okay. And and so Fernando and Andre in this context proved that the the Morse index of all these guys is less than or equal to one. So the, so the ba so now we have a manifold with boundary. Everything is stable except maybe one component which is unstable. So let's say this is the unstable. The unstable surface. Okay, so so the third step, step three, is to minimize uh, the area uh, for any unstable minimal surface. Minimal surface uh, into into uh, our manifold, which we've cut out the handle bodies from M prime. So by the theorem of Meek, Simon, Yao that I said in the beginning, you could actually minimize uh, in that isotopy class, and, and you produce something isotopic to what you started with, which is minimal. Okay, so so we so we minimize area, and then we remove so we remove the collar 
between uh, the unstable guy, the unstable sigma, let's call it sigma L, and, and the stable one that comes from minimizing and stable uh, minimizer. So is that clear? So you have something unstable, you minimize, and now we have a three manifold. So now I get a new three manifold, m double tilde. So now I have a manifold m double tilde, which has stable boundary. Excuse me, can this not be empty? Sorry? Can this m double be empty? Um, it cannot be empty, no. That's a good question. Yeah, it cannot be empty. If we assume that this non-orientable thing, so in RP3, it can happen, right? Because you cut a neck, and then you bound an interval bundle over RP2, and then it, you would get, it would be empty. But it, so yeah, so I'm assuming that this strange thing with the non-orientable surface doesn't happen. Yeah, that's a good point. OK, so now we have a, a, a manifold with stable boundary, and I want to iterate this whole procedure. So now I consider sweep outs of, the manif of this m double prime. And I want to say that when I do that, I get a component in the interior of the manifold. Okay? And then I could, the manifold at each stage will get smaller. So, so, so this the precise the statement we need is, so when I, when I do min-max on, on M, this manifold with stable boundary, <coughs> Uh, I, I obtain a component in the interior, in the interior of the manifold. Okay, and, and so in this way, at each stage, if I don't get something isotopic to to, to the Haggard surface, I, I produce. So 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 if so then we right. So if we had that, we would just iterate this procedure. Okay, and we would get a nested, a nested sequence of stable minimal surfaces if this procedure kept going infinitely many times. And because they're stable, they have curvature bounds. And because they're nested, you actually would produce a Jacobi field. So you produce a Jacobi field, which contradicts the genericity of the metric. Any questions about that? So that was their sketch, which they had in the 80s. But what was needed is to know when you do min-max, you always have an unstable component. So when I do min-max on this guy with stable boundary, I always get something which is unstable, so which is inside. Questions? Maybe I still yeah. Ask yeah, yeah. Is there any topological reason that make sure I'm double prime is not empty? I wonder whether you have an unstable guy minimax to collapse to all the other boundaries. Maybe yeah, so you could have that in RP3. So in RP3, if you have something like this, uh, if this is your unstable guy, this is this is this is an RP2. So you could, if if you minimize like this, you will just hit this guy with multiplicity two. Why this cannot? So I'm assuming I didn't say it. I should have. But that that after doing a neck pinch, you're not isotopic to a, a minimal a non-orientable minimal surface. The only way the volume could be zero is if there's an unorientable minimal surface that it, it's the boundary of a tubular neighborhood of. But you cannot collapse this with this joint, stable joint? No, 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 it can't, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a good. OK. OK. Any other questions about that sketch? So why did they stabilize and minimize the dissonance from the stable surface? Sorry? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the other, so you have now a guy with stable boundary. You do min max. You get a bunch of stable guys, and we're going to claim that that you also get an, an an index one guy. So now you minimize the index one guy into the rest of the manifold, so it's stable. Now you have a new manifold which is strictly smaller than the one you started with. So now you have a a nested family of minimal surfaces which are stable. You want to produce an index one guy. Right? Yeah. All we really need is something inside. So if we knew that there was a, a stable guy inside, that would be fine. Then we, that would still give us a, a smaller manifold. Then we do min-max in the smaller manifold. Yeah. 
So what we really need is that at each stage there's something in the interior which arises oh, this way. With Sorry? State, getting a stable guy with multiplicity. Well, we could always get spheres with multiplicity. So, but you can't get genus with multiplicity because of the the proposition that I sketched. Okay. All right. So. I'm not going to talk about three manifolds anymore, which is probably for the best. I'm going to talk about a very simple manifold. So you see what it was needed, right, is to, to get something inside the manifold. So, um, so for, the, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to discuss just a simple proposition. <coughs> So it's just a three ball. So I have a three ball, OK? And um, so I know that the, the boundary of the three ball, so I have a, a three ball with a metric, right? And um, I'm assuming that the boundary of the three ball is strictly stable. The conclusion is that, that, that um, there exists an index 1 index 1 or 0 minimal s2 inside uh, the interior of the three ball. So in other words, there is some minimal surface that's a sphere that's inside. Yeah. Say? Yeah, so their sketch was, the missing part was when you have a manifold with stable boundary to produce something inside the, inside the, the, ma the manifold with boundary of, of a controlled topological type. So this is the simplest case where you have that, right? You have a three ball, and you need to get a minimal surface in the interior of the three ball, okay? which is just a two-sphere. Oh, I didn't say that. Yeah, hold on one sec. Hold on. Index 1 uh, or 0, minimal S2 inside B3. Yeah. So what are you saying? You can't get a boundary. Exactly. Yeah. So, so 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 why it looks of course like it's hard to believe that this problem, you know, is a, was not known. Um, but but uh, the danger, as Fernando says, is if you so you have a three ball. So you have your nice three ball. You you sweep it out. Uh, you do min max. But what you, what what you could get is that the min max limit. Uh, could be, it could just be, so if I call this boundary gamma, I could just be getting k times gamma for some k bigger, bigger than 1. It, it, seem, it looks crazy, right? I mean, how could that happen? But, 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 but that's an issue in min-max theory is ruling out uh, multiplicities. So what, what we do in, in this paper is we are able to rule out multiplicity in this case. Um. Okay. Right. So let so so. Okay. So we're going to assume that that uh, that that this bad thing does happen. So let's suppose. Uh, that the min-max limit is equal to k times gamma, where k is bigger than 1. So that means that I have a, a sequence of sweepouts of the three ball, which are getting closer and closer to being optimal. So that means that I have a sequence of, of min-max sequences, uh, where the, so I have, so that means I have a sequence, uh, right, of min-max sequences such that such that the maximal area for my family uh, is, is, is getting closer and closer to. Um, so I'm actually going to not do general k. I'm just going to show the argument for k equals 2. And the, for higher k, it will work. So suppose what we're getting is just uh, something like this. So I have a sequence of, of, of sweep outs where the maximal slice is as close as I want to the thing I'm trying to rule out. 
So, let, so let me draw a picture of, of what the family would be doing. So, so my family, right, it's going to start at the, at the uh, stable guy and fully, and, 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 do, and uh, so it starts at the stable guy, but its area maybe goes above, a little bit above twice, like that, and then it goes down. So I'm assuming that I, I have this optimal, nearly optimal family. Oh, I can't put that up. Ah. OK. OK, so, so now for that uh, family, for that min-max, uh, for that sweep out, let me define the the following set. So this is the, the slices uh, where my min-max surface, sorry, where the surface and the sweep out is is epsilon close to the is epsilon close to, to twice the, the guy I'm trying to rule out. Okay, so, so this is this is sort of the bad set. So you can imagine that maybe so maybe in this interval here all my surfaces are are very close as variables to twice the uh, the twice the stable boundary with multiplicity too. So we're going to prove some sort of deformation theorem, and and so our the argument is inspired by other deformation theorems that were used by uh, Fernando and Andre in the Amgren pit setting, and the deformation theorem says that given my sweep out which comes close to the bad configuration, so what we're going to do is find uh, a new family. Let me call it uh, another family, which such that the the set where it's close is actually empty. So the set where this new family is close to uh, to twice the stable minimal surface is actually empty. My handwriting is not so good. I realize so it's so, so you so. Basically, we have a family which is coming close to twice. We're going to push it away so that it's, it's not in that little neighborhood in the Varifold topology. Okay. Okay. Oh, man, hello. So, so the way we're going to do this is there's two parts. There's, there's first an observation. And then there's a sort of other parts, which I'll get into. So the first observation is, so this guy is, is the, the minimal sphere. And this guy is like almost the minimal sphere with multiplicity 2. So, so, what is, so how could it be that a multiplicity 1 guy, so let me draw w what could be happening. So right, at, this is the three ball. At, at time 0, I am just equal to the boundary. Because my sweep out starts at the, I'm considering sweep outs. Which, you know, which start here and which we don't know what they do, but they definitely start there. So how could this guy get close to twice this guy? So what would have to happen if you think about it is, what would, so on one side, the uh, so think of I'll shade the volume between the surface and and this boundary. Uh, let's see. Right. So so what would be happening? It would be coming in and more and more to itself until it's close to twice like this. Okay, but if it does that, it's already it's already a sweep out of the three ball. Is, is that is, is it clear? The only way to go from being a one copy of the boundary to being close to two copies is by being a sweep out, because the volume switches. Uh, at time zero, you, you bound zero volume on one side and the full volume on the other. At the other time, you, you've swapped the two the two pieces. Okay, so so the observation is right that this that this segment, this this just this little piece of the sweep out starting here and, and right when we so this is the neighborhood we want to avoid I, is already a sweep out, and now when I'm here I'm very close to twice a stable minimal surface. Okay, so that's the so that's the idea. So we want, what we really want to do is, is make a new family which avoids this set. And we do it just by finding some way to bring something that looks like twice a minimal sphere down to 0. Okay? And, then, and then we have a new family 
like this, which, uh, which avoids the set we wanted to avoid. All right. OK. So, so the remainder of the, let me <clears throat> so the remainder of the talk, so we need a way to, um, to interpolate uh, between you know something near something close to two times this minimal surface and the zero surface just a trivial you know a trivial ball okay okay so 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 let me call this little interval where you're getting close t t0 to t1 So what does the surface look like at time t0? So let's just draw a picture. So here we have, so this is like, this is my, I'm just enlarging the picture. This is, this is gamma. And uh, because it's stable, there's a neighborhood where it's really least area. And you have a, you can sort of push off in an area increasing way. So, so what does my surface look like? Well, it, it looks like, so this is, I'm going to try to draw the surface. Uh, T0 when you're first close. It's some crazy surface. It looks sort of like a multiplicity two sphere, and it's in that tubular neighborhood. Maybe it has little tentacles which are going out like that. Okay? For, right, we, we only know it's close as varifold, epsilon close to twice, but, but uh, you still could have these little tentacles coming out. Uh, and so we could deal with those in a way which was first done by, <coughs> by Rafael Montezuma. So how he argues is we want a way to put these tentacles in here without increasing area at all, really, along the way. So what he does is he looks at, you look at all isotopies supported out here, which, which, de which don't add area more than some arbitrary amount. And you produce a minimal surface then by Meek, Simon, Yao or something. And if there were a point, if it had a point in the interior of this outside region, then you would contradict the monotonicity formula because you have a definite amount of area, but you assume we're assuming we're epsilon close as varifolds to this guy. Okay, so I won't. So if, if the epsilon, remember we're de we're deforming away the epsilon neighborhood of twice that guy. So if epsilon is small enough, then the area out here is small enough, and so you couldn't have a minimal surface out here when you minimize. Okay, so I'm not going to focus on that part. So we assume we can sort of push in and not increase area. Okay, but, but, but now what we need is a, some sort of interpolation theorem. We know we're in this nice tubular neighborhood. This is the nice tubular neighborhood of the stable minimal surface. We need a way to bring the area down to zero. So, so this is the main technical heart of what we really do in the paper. It's an interpolation theorem. And the picture is I have a, it's the picture I've been drawing. You have a stable minimal surface and a tubular neighborhood where the area goes up a little bit. So suppose I have a surface in, uh, in this little tubular neighborhood, is an embedded two sphere, uh, an embedded. OK, then the statement is then uh, for all delta bigger than 0, there's an isotopy. Uh, let's just call it sigma t up to sigma 1, so that I start out at the uh, my initial surface. Uh, at the, at the final time of the isotopy, the, so this is equal to, it's either equal to gamma or uh, it's a small ball around any point. Around any point. 
OK? So, so I'm just saying, OK, so let me write it first. And then the, the third statement is that the area along the way never adds more than this constraint delta. Sorry? Fixed but small. It could be big, yeah. It's small enough so that you have the projection map to, to press in. So you use minus one minus. Hmm? That means that uh, the interval can be very large. Same. Your notation is the gamma cross minus one one. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, you guys are right. Okay, fine. Let's just call it epsilon. So whenever you have a stable, strictly stable surface, you have a nice little tubular neighborhood like that. So this is like the epsilon tubular neighborhood. Uh, where the stable guy is really the minimizer. Okay, so, so the reason this constraint is important, right? The whole point is we want an isotopy which does not increase area along the way. The reason it's important is because we have to glue it in here, right? And if we want to increase area a little bit, then we might go over the width. And so we might not actually avoid the region we were trying to avoid. Maybe I draw another picture. So just so you, I feel like I haven't done the th statement justice. So I have this tubular neighborhood of a stable surface, and I have some, some crazy, some crazy two sphere. Okay, I'm, we, we, here we're not assuming that it's close to twice or anything. We claim that we could bring the area down to zero, without ever going up along the way. Or we go up, but arbitrarily small. Yeah. Close to gamma, that's down to zero. Same. Your sigma y is close to gamma, right? So you say you bring down to zero. Right? We bring down. So what could happen is you're, you're, there's two cases, right? It could be that your sphere is is sort of essential, like that, and then you just bring down to one copy. Yeah. Or it's it bounds a little ball, right? It could also be that it just bounds. It's inessential, and then it just bound, goes down to zero, like in the multiplicity two case, you bring it down to a point. But in the second case, how do you say that sigma is equal to gamma uh, and it's small ball? Or, so, so there's two cases. Either gamma is brought down to one copy of, of, of like that, or your sphere is, is, is sort of can just be brought down to a single point. Yeah, so this is two cases. Or a small ball of around any point. Any other questions? So, Depends on the surface, yeah. But what matters is what's important is that we do it for all any delta, any threshold you give me, I have a way to do it. So let me make a comment. Um, how would you do this? Well, you would want to just use mean curvature flow, right? You, you have a two sphere. There's only one critical point, the stable sphere. You should just run mean curvature flow and flow down to one copy or zero copies. Of course, the problem is that in the 40 years that there's been mean curvature flow, nobody can do that. <laughs> Even when there's one critical point, even we're not talking about you know a k-parameter family or any you know smell type. We're just talking about a single sphere to bring it down to points. So, so that's not known how to do using mean curvature flow. So we have to do it by hand. Sorry, I couldn't resist this. So, uh, <laughs> um, right. So, okay. So, th so the manifold, the Arambia manifold, really is S2 cross R that we're worried about. It's the neighborhood of a stable minimal surface. Um, I want to just explain how you would do this <laughs> in R3. <coughs> so we want an isotopy between a random sphere. So, 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 so let's just look at the, we have to deal in, in, this, in a fundamental way with S2 cross R. But in R3, I claim that the problem is a lot uh, simpler. So suppose I have a wild sphere in, in R3. Okay, and I want to go down to a nice round sphere. And I want to do it in a way where the area never goes up. So if you think about it, how would you do it? I mean, <laughs> there's two ways I could think of. Um, right, so one way is you, so, so, so I, I haven't said this, but so, so Alexander's theorem, it says that there is some isotopy between there and there. 
just like in the S2 cross R case, Alexander's theorem says there's some isotopy to either that or that. Um, but of course, the Alexander's theorem is not a quantif it doesn't give you a quantitative thing. It doesn't say that the area doesn't go up. Okay, so what you do is you just suppose the area has to go up a lot. So you, you enclose them in a big ball. You shrink the ball to arbitrarily small size. You do your isotopy downstairs when it's really shrunk, and then you go back to normal size. So you have these dilations in R3. Um, another way, another proof is enclose them in a big ball. Okay. By Alexander's theorem, there is some path between these two. So we, so we do min-max on the family of paths that joined them. We would, if, if there was not a path which sort of went down all the way, if it went up a little bit, then we would produce a compact embedded minimal surface in a three ball, which those tend not to exist. So, so the reason why it's easy in R3 is because you have these dilations, and you don't have compact embedded minimal surfaces. And of course, those two are basically the same side, of the, you know, different sides of the same coin. But S2 cross R is very different. <laughs> There's no way to do this kind of thing. So with S2 cross R, the only operation we could do is just squeezing the surface like this. OK, but squeezing the surface doesn't, it brings the area down, but it doesn't actually make it any more simple. It just takes all the complexity of the surface and squishes it into one place. OK, so, okay, so, 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 so it's all about S2 cross R versus, versus R3. Right. OK. So I will tell you what we do, I think. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my. How about the second idea? Say? How about the second idea? But you, you, you go back to getting the thing with multiplicity. Yeah, yeah, that's the issue. Stable with multiplicity is the issue. Right. So um, trying to think how the best way to explain everything is. So OK. OK, so, so what are we going to do? So, so the, the general idea is, uh, so we have our, our stable guy, and we have our sort of crazy surface. We don't know what it does. So what we're going to do is, 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 is cover, it by, cover it by balls like this. Um, and uh, so we could try to do what we did in R3 to a single ball. OK. Um, so, so, so what we're going to do first, so our first step. So this is a local process. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is straighten, uh, straighten our sigma in all balls uh, so that it consists of k graphs. Together with uh, with with uh, several with, with, with a thin set of nets. Okay, so the picture is it's going to be some. We want to make it look in some sort of canonical form where it just you know has some weird neck set, but but it really outside of this thin set just consists of graphs. Okay, and once we have it in that form. Uh, step two is we need to find a neck, find a neck uh, to bring to bring down k in some ball. And once we've brought down the number of graphs in one ball, then we go back to step one, 
and we straighten it all and, and bring k down further until we get either to 0 or 1. Maybe I'll, I'll mention uh, briefly something about step two. Suppose we were able to get it into nice form, where it just consists of two graphs joined by some, some neck. So, so suppose, suppose we, in step, you know, we're able to get it to something that looks like two copies of a sphere, but it has some wild knotted neck here. Right? We want to be able to sort of open that neck and bring down the area to zero, right? The goal would be to open that neck and bring down the area to zero. Uh, and actually, uh, we, I think we were confused for uh, a day or so because it looks like that neck is impossible to open because it's, it's, uh, it's knotted. <laughs> um, but it turns out that, um, so, so how, how would we ever open this neck? So it turns out there's a nice theorem in topology called the light bulb, the light bulb theorem. And it says that if I have S2 cross an interval, like here, right, and I have some arc A uh, from A0 to A1, so some maybe not at arc, uh, then, then it can be isotoped. to a vertical arc. To a nice vertical arc. So why is it called the light bulb theorem? So this, I think I, I learned this from Francesco, actually. He helped to explain this to me. So the, so why is it called the light bulb theorem? It's because if you have a sort of, Imagine you have a sort of light bulb hanging from the ceiling, but it's, it's hanging in a knotted, in a sort of awful knotted way. So how would you unknot it? That, that's essentially what we're saying. Like, how could you, is there a way to unknot it? What you would do is any time you have a, a, a sort of crossing that you want to undo, you sort of move the crossing and bring it over the two-sphere and pull it to the other side. Or the way you might think about it is you just push the bulb through the cord in such a way that it will unknot. Okay? So, so if we get our configuration to look like this, we could always we could always unknot it, and then we would produce a nice uh, vertical vertical neck, which we could then just open up and bring the area down to zero. It, okay, it, it's a little more complicated than that because you could have necks within necks and so forth. Um, Okay, but I haven't really told you how we're going to get it into a sort of a form which consists of a bunch of parallel graphs. So let me let me do that in the last couple of minutes. Um, well, actually, maybe I won't write it down because it's sort of it's sort of maybe I'll just explain it in in in, in words. So, okay. So we have, we could always project the surface close, as close as we want here. And what I'm going to assume is that I could always assume I'm going to choose balls. So I choose balls uh, covering gamma, which are so small so that uh, the area, the area of gamma in the ball, I'm oh, sorry, of sigma in the ball is less than maybe delta over 100. Remember, delta is the threshold. So all of these balls have less area than, um, than the threshold. So I just want to consider just one of those balls. Suppose I have a ball, and let's just do the simplest case. Suppose it just looks like some wiggly disk. I want to make that disk flat in a way which doesn't increase area. 
So again, by Alexander's theorem, there is an isotopy which makes this flat, which doesn't, w w w there's some isotopy between that disk and the flat disk. But the area may have to go really, really large a priori. So what we're going to do is we're going to shrink. So we're going to do a blow down, uh, a blow down, blow up construction. So what I'm going to do is, is first, so there's some isotopy. Let's just call it gamma, which goes between the, the surface we don't like and the surface we like. So what I'm going to do is first shrink. So the first step is to shrink, shrink, the, th shrink the whole ball. So I shrink the ball. And I, when I do that, I, I sort of am coning over the boundary. So now I have that inside. OK? Now I do the isotopy in the shrunken, in the shrunken set. And then I expand back to so so, so, so I, I do this, and then I do the shrunken isotopy. So now, so that step, when I do the shrunken isotopy, I make this guy nice and flat, and then I rescale, and then I uh, and then I rescale back to the unit size. So what's the problem with this? The problem is when I do this, right, I'm adding, I'm coning over the boundary. I'm coning over the boundary. So I need that the area that I add is smaller than delta, the threshold. I need that the area of the boundary length is, is going to be uh, of order delta. But because I could just assume that the balls are so small that the area in all of the balls is less than you know something much smaller in terms of delta, I could always find some. Uh, boundary curve, maybe not the full ball, but maybe three quarters of the ball, where the length is the appropriate length, so that when I cone over the length, I don't add more than delta. OK, so, 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 so what we do is we have a messy surface. We shrink. We make it non-messy, nice graphical, and then, we, and then we expand back to unit size. And we could do it in a way where we don't add uh, more than delta of area. We do that until we, so, so we, you know, if, if my surface looked like some crazy annulus, this procedure would just, would just open up the annulus in an area decreasing way. And certainly this is area decreasing because the disk has less area than any sort of any disk which is non-graphical, for instance. So, so we're able to reduce things a little bit, or at least not make them much worse, while maintaining the constraint. Sorry, Dan. Yes. Right. Right. Well, we know that there's some by the co-area formula. I'm assuming the area is less than, than this delta, that there's some, there's some radius where it's what you expect. The, the, the length of it is sort of comparable to delta over, over r, say, if r is the radius of the ball. And so then when you cone over it, you just add things of order delta. So the assumption is that the area of the surface in all of these little balls yeah. is very small. Is very small, less than the constraint. And that means that some. Some of the some boundary curve, maybe not the ball, but maybe three quarters of the ball has the length that you would that you expect, which is like uh, delta over r. And then when you add the cone, you're adding delta over r times r, and so it's all less than delta. Yeah. Okay. So so the rough idea is we can't in R three we have dilations in S two cross r we don't have dilations, but we could do everything locally. But it just is a real pain because <laughs> you have to patch all these balls together, right? <laughs> That's kind of the the issue. And then you need a global argument to actually find a neck using this light bulb trick. Yeah. So, so you. No, no. So, so yeah. So here you have a. There's an isotopy from here to there. What we're doing is sh is shrinking it, doing the isotopy, and then again. You mean? Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm. I'm so right. So there's this issue, which is. The boundary is still wiggly. So you need to interpolate between a wiggly boundary and a flat boundary. But if you, you could do that in a way which does not increase area by something. It increase, may increase area, but by something you can make small by further squeezing. Because you could take so basically all the wiggles, you could just press very, very close to the, to the core. OK, and then, yeah, so then, one, then you have to look one dimension less. So now you have a cylinder, basically, with these wiggly curves. And you could straighten out the cylinder. You could straighten out those curves to make them totally flat. And you might increase area, but, but, but 
the amount you increase it is not more than can be shrunk by by squeezing. Remember, any time at any point in this process, you could take your surface, whatever it is, and just press it further in here. You know, press it, and, and that will shrink all the the, the wiggles. Okay, this is, no, that's a that's a very good question because it's it's a, it's important. Okay, so any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, maybe we should ask this after uh, wine. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I was wondering. So, if you have a like a smooth surface in, in that setting and you squeeze it really a lot, yeah. So, shouldn't mean curvature flow just shoot it to the sphere somehow? Because then the you know it's very much bent. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, the idea is that uh, somehow it's the folds that should really move. Uh, the fl yeah, the folds should move faster than, than so anything else. I yeah. was wondering whether possibly using the level set approach, uh -huh. there might be a way to understand, uh, you know. That's a, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, if it's a, yeah, I don't know the answer, though. Because it's tiny necks. Sorry? It's tiny necks. Yeah, next could want to, but but you could push them as tight as you close as you want, so that they would just right, open. I'm thinking, say one D would be just finite and many Grim Reapers, mm -hmm. right? Moving the, the yeah. Stuff. So or don't you need like some min convexity in order to be able to like the set approach? I mean, uh, yeah, but in this case, since it's so degenerate, uh, maybe oh yeah, uh, it could be much harder. But just uh, you know, for curiosity. Yeah, it's a good. That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, is there really a way to control uh, two Grim Reapers that uh, sort of move uh, really fast, uh, mm -hmm. uh, one versus the other, and then, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great, that's an interesting question, because you're in a very near degenerate situation yeah. where you might hope to do something better, but I don't know. <coughs> it's basically, yeah, the you're moving uh, by uh, curvature flow. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the folds, the basically, where the mul yeah, when you project, you get this integer multiplicity thing with yeah. changing integers, and so you have some boundary curves yeah. where the integers so change. Like a super fast, uh, flow. Yeah, yeah, you should. Uh, but, 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 if you have uh, one of those knotted necks, they, they may not your mean curvature flow is not going to help you yeah. <laughs> because you need a way to actually open. Uh, yeah. Maybe yeah. you need a smooth, a smooth deformation. Yeah, yeah maybe it's got to be smooth. Approach, I mean, Yeah, I mean, I it's. I think the not. You remember, you could also have necks inside necks. You could have necks, you know, going into other necks. I mean, it, the thin set is not just a single <coughs> knotted arc. It could yeah, it could be very complicated. Yeah. So I just gave the simplest non-trivial example, but we have to deal with all of that. Another question? Yeah. So what is the the greatest level of generality for this specific field? Like for the, um, you know, the the existence <coughs> of the index one. Mm -hmm. So right now it's just a strongly reducible surface. It's, it has an index but one. You don't care about the number of boundary components, right? So you, you have the assumption that the well in the toy model you explained you have the assumption that the boundary was a stable minimal surface. But I guess you can you can have as many as you want, right? Yeah, but we that's do no produce. With that. What's that? Yeah, we do produce an index one guy. That's no matter what the the boundary components are just a step in the process of producing the surface. No, 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 but I mean the, the ambient manifold. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do we have any restriction on the, the number of boundary components? No. No, no. As long as it's stable, strictly stable, mm -hmm. it's okay. So what about how we project? Which one? <coughs> so it, impr it implies it in the, in the uh, hyperbolic case. Hyperbolic. Yeah. Because it'll get spheres. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, uh, that's right, yeah, so. We don't need to do all this for that, actually. You're right. But for, for positive curvature, w this is needed. Like positive scalar curvature, where you can have stable spheres. This is, this is needed. Other questions? Well, let's thank Sarah again. Thank you.